Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon, and you might well be new here because I look at the analytics on this channel and since I, I think I last recorded an episode two weeks ago because I did a whole bunch and then I didn't, I've kind of forgotten how to do them. And uh, since then, a lot more people are watching this channel. So welcome if you are new. Thank you for being here. Just so you're not confused. I, uh, w- I, I in front of me right now, if you're listening to this, well, you won't be able to see it. Maybe you can hear this script that Callum has written for me. Callum is the writer here on uh, Catch a Criminalist. I'm going to read it. I'm going to add some thoughts if I have any. And uh, that's that's what we do here. So let's just jump in. This one is Joshua Roy Tucker, The Body Snatcher Murder, which already sounds kind of scary. I have no idea about this. This was a Callum. Sometimes I find the suggestions and I'm like, Callum, did you hear about this? It's absolutely horrific. Do you want to go write about it? Callum's like, yes, I do. Sometimes he finds his own horrific things. So uh, finally, let's get into it. Do you ever feel like you're being watched? (laughs) Nah, I take a pill for that, Callum. Actually, that's kind of a stupid question nowadays. At this very moment, most of you out there will be within earshot of at least two or three listening devices, and maybe even have a webcam pointed right at your face. Everyone say hello to the nice man from the uh, the NSA. Hello. So it is insane. I'm at my desk right now. I have... Well, obviously a camera pointing at me, this microphone in front of me, there's microphones on all of the various devices. I've got an iPad here, which must have like, I don't know, (laughs) it's incredible what it does. It's probably like eight cameras, but where? We're always being watched. I mean, no one cares. It's like what you do, just pottering around your house. I film me videos. I I don't think anyone really cares what I'm up to. Anyway, yeah, it's kind of a given these days that the government's agencies and corporate giants have the power to harvest data from inside our own homes. The best thing to do is just not to think about it. But what if you just couldn't shake that feeling? What if you started to realize that the forces behind this digital home invasion weren't just looking to lock your masturbation and shopping habits? (laughs) What if they were beginning to threaten your family? I like to think that if I was in that situation, I'd be like, this is probably the point where I need to go and see a psychiatrist. But I realize that if I was thinking that, I probably wouldn't realize that I need... I'd probably think that people... It's complicated. I'd hope that someone would tell me I need to go get some bills. This was the nightmare endured by one man in 2018. Joshua Roy Tucker's relatively peaceful life in rural Canada was turned upside down when his home was plagued by strange occurrences and mysterious visitors who threatened the lives of those he loved most. Whoa. Unless this is actually happening to you, in which case, that's insane. I'd very quickly verify it. Like... I mean, if my webcam talked to me, I'd be like, okay, someone's on the other side of my webcam and has hacked my shit or something like that. (laughs) But if I, you know, if you hear like whispers and stuff, I'd be like, probably I need a different kind of help. But if this guy actually had that, that's wild. The Tuckers. Joshua was born in 1991 in Saskatchewan province of Canada. Shortly after giving birth to him, his biological mother decided to put him up for adoption. Little Joshua found a loving home when he was just four days old with Kim and Gordon Tucker. The couple lived on a peaceful farm near the village of Cochin, maybe? Around 30 minutes from the town of Battlefield great town name. I mean, not really super surprising. I'm guessing there was a battle there where Joshua went to school. After dropping out of high school in his mid-teens, he got increasingly involved with local gang members and was indirectly implicated in some of their dealings. His adoptive father had to drive down to the police station to pick him up on more than one occasion. Still, the two remained close. In fact, Joshua had a loving relationship with both of his parents throughout his teens and twenties. Eventually, Kim and Gordon turned from saintly parents to doting grandparents when Joshua had a child of his own. They even stepped in to take custody of the little boy when he and his ex-partner were unable to provide for them. These sound like great people. They adopted him and then they help out with, I mean, they adopt him so they're bound to help out with his kids, but that these seem like good people. It might have been the birth of his son which helped inspire Joshua to clean up his act. He stopped getting involved in drugs when he was 27 and cut off contact with his old gang member buddies. You'd think that things would generally improve from there, but in fact, this marked the turning point where Joshua's life descended into David Fincher levels of weird. I am so curious as to what's about to happen. <laughs> I, I still don't know. Is Joshua insane or is Joshua like actually being tormented by people inside his like cameras? <laughs> Oh my. It began with the fear of retaliation from his old acquaintances, whose business dealings Joshua knew a fair bit about. Then came the strange noises from his attic, and then threats from an unseen menace. Over the course of several weeks, the danger slowly revealed itself until Joshua's worst fears were realized his son was kidnapped. Okay, things got real. This totally, yeah, okay. You don't imagine your son getting kidnapped. When Joshua went to ask his father for help, he had a, dude, why aren't you going to the police? 
He had a disturbing realization the man in the living room wasn't his father. It was an intruder sitting in the chair. Joshua rushed out to his car, grabbed his rifle, and pointed at the imposter, shouting, Where is my son? I, okay, now, now I'm beginning. <laughs> Is anyone else going down this same mental path journey of me? Because I know there's this condition where you don't recognize your closest family members. So maybe this is what happening, what's happening to him. Or maybe the gang did kidnap his son and replace his dad. This is more like, this is like not casual criminalist. This is like casual mystery. I love it. I like, I like mystery novels. <laughs> Strange happenings at the Tucker Farm. It all started in the early spring of that year at Joshua's home on the farm. His parents lived in a different house on the property, meaning that he had the entire place to himself, or so he thought. In April, Joshua began hearing strange sounds from the attic, footsteps and voices above his head. Anyone who's been following the show will be well aware of the horrifying reality of unwanted squatters and how deadly they can be. Yeah, if you haven't watched the previous episode, I... I can't remember what it's called. Someone's definitely gonna mention it in the comments, or maybe I'll put it in the description about the dude who was living in the, the, the attic of that person's house. For like months, dude. That was scary. And I was like, Simon, have you checked that cupboard in your office yet? And I'm like, yes, I did. And there was nothing in there. <laughs> if you're new, you've got no idea what's going on. But uh, don't worry about it. Just watch all the old episodes. That's all you have to do. Easy. By the time Joshua worked up the nerve to confront his unwanted guests, they had already disappeared. He assumed they had snuck out through a crawl space and started frantically searching the old fa farmhouse for their secret entrance, but to no avail. The squatters would intermittently return every now and again through April into May. Joshua's mother called the police to come and investigate the attic, but they couldn't find any clear point of entry, so they refused to investigate further. Joshua was distraught. Not even the police could help him. He would have to take matters into his own hands, and his methods were fairly extreme. A few days later, he was startled by a creaking footstep above him. His guests had returned, and this time he wasn't going to let them get away. Listening out for whispering voices, he manically cut a hole in the ceiling with an axe, hoping to catch them off guard. But once again, the intruders slipped away into their hiding place. Well, okay, now I'm definitely leaning towards the fact that this guy has... Is it like paranoid schizophrenia or whatever, where you imagine people um, like in your house? I heard, I don't know if this is like, this is one of those things I read ages ago, but I remember one of the first uh, symptoms of like paranoid schizophrenia is where you think you hear whispers. So you'll be like in your room in the house and like someone else from your family will be in the other room and you'll just hear them whispering and you're, you're like, try to listen to it and you won't really be able to hear it properly. But you'll think that they're talking about you. You might hear your name and then you go through there and no one's whispering. And I'm like, just finding that out gave me shivers down my spine. And when I, I found out when I was a kid, I was, I was like, Am I hearing voices? It's like, no, definitely not. You just got freaked out by that that thing you read on the internet, Simon. <laughs> Stop reading the scary pages of the internet. A desperate Joshua decided this was the last time he would be fooled, and he resorted to shooting the ceiling at the source of the sounds next time he heard a tap from above. But then when he went to check, nothing. No home invaders, no secret crawl, crawl space, absolutely no sign of anything beyond a few, few bullet holes in the rafters. But he did find one thing as he inspected the Swiss cheese remains of his ceiling. A small electrical device which he had thought had no right being there. It was plain as day in the palm of his hand. His house had been bugged. Had the police decided he was actually more heavily involved in his old buddy's criminal activities than he had let on? Of course, they weren't interested in helping him out with the so-called squatters. They were behind the whole thing. This little electronic bug, whether it was installed by the police or the gang, must have been the source of the sounds all along. Joshua tore the place apart trying to debug each room, and more surveillance devices turned up in the ceiling and walls, some with what he believed to be speakers attached to them. And things got only stranger from here. I am absolutely now down the... If this turns out to be real, I have my mind blown, because I am down the path of Joshua being unwell. I mean, these like secret listening devices and speakers installed in his ceilings where he had some minor gang stuff going on in the part? I don't think so. I mean, you're not like a Russian spy mate. The Imposters. See, Joshua's theories on the identity of his mysterious spies developed through the following days. This wasn't the work of the police, nor any low-level local gangsters. Sure, they might be connected, but the people watching him were likely part of something much bigger. And down the path I go. And he reckons he could guess what they were after. They wanted the farm. Rather than continue blasting his ceiling like that Texan from The Simpsons, Joshua decided he better start patrolling the fields throughout the day and night to catch any intruders that might be roaming the fields. He began checking in on his parents by phone dozens of times a day, worried that his enemies might be planning to kill them to get a hold of their property. His parents seemed very competent and good, and they adopted him, and they seemed to have their heads very firmly screwed on. If I was his parents, I'd be like, dude, dude, 
you you gotta cut you know this is an intervention or whatever you do it's that you need some assistance Kim, his mother, started to worry about her son. About bloody time, Kim. When she went around to check on him in mid-May, he showed her one of the devices that had been discovered in the wall, but she wasn't convinced by his explanation. She took the piece along to a local electrician to prove to him that there was no reason to worry. She also ordered a device online which he could use to scan the house for surveillance tech. But Joshua wouldn't have it. Even if his own mother wouldn't believe him, he knew what was really going on. Their family had been the target of an organization which had infiltrated their homes and their lives. The organization was killing people around town and replacing them with government clones oh dear here we are hence the lying electrician and that sketchy bus driver from the other day oh my in fact managed to kill one of the body snatchers in the attic but the body disappeared by the time he got up and his attack only made the spooks angrier the voices he heard were communications coming through the bugs direct from the organization who sometimes sent him messages through tv shows and they were coming to kill them all kim sighed heartbroken things were clearly much worse than she thought an uneasy homecoming Her son had suffered from paranoia in the past, but nothing like this. Before, it had come and gone sporadically, but this time, it was swallowing him whole. She decided to arrange for a sophisticated alarm to be installed in Joshua's house, hoping that that would be enough to reassure his calm and frayed nerves. If anything, that's just going to make it worse. I really feel like that is not a good move. It's that like you can't battle this kind of... Look, I'm not an expert. I don't know anything about psychology, but surely you can't battle that kind of paranoid delusion with logic because you're not starting from a place of logic you're starting from this place of crazy illogic you gotta battle it with like mental health professionals <laughs> The security company couldn't install the system until the 31st, so in the meantime, Kim invited her son to live in the basement of the family home, where she and Gordon, now in their late 50s, could look after him. She wasn't the only one who had grown worried about his mental state. On the 25th of May, the same officer who had checked the attic was sent over to the Tucker farm on a wellness call, phoned in by Joshua's biological mother, Darian Flat. Unexpected visits from the police were always so relaxing, so I'm sure this did wonders for his paranoia. Things got predictably worse from there. Joshua started directly addressing the spook spying on him in the basement Late at night, demanding they leave him and his family alone. Of course, they refused and reacted by intensifying their threats. How is he not in care yet? How is how is he not in a doctor's office? As things escalated, Gordon Tucker suggested to his wife that she take a few days for herself and go visit her family in British Columbia. She decided that it would be for the best. Then it was just Joshua and his father in the house. Oh, and the government agents, of course. Over the following days, their voices began to taunt Joshua more and more insidiously, threatening his son and goading him to kill his whole family. Then on the 30th, the messages changed. They were no longer just threatening. The organization had kidnapped his son from school. The Kidnapping Joshua was terrified when the announcement came from the walls. To prove they had his boy, the spooks even let him hear the kid's voice coming through the speakers. Panicking, Joshua went to his father for help, but stopped when he reached the living room. Why was his father sitting and watching TV? At this time of day, he should be out working in the fields, and unless it wasn't his father at all, the body snatchers had finally got to him. This was an imposter directly involved in the plot to kidnap the boy. Perhaps his one and only chance to find out where they were taking him. Joshua rushed out to his car, grabbed his rifle, and pointed it at the intruder. Oh, guys, I don't know what happens, but I really hope he doesn't kill the dad because he should be he should be already in a hospital. Where is my son? He screamed. Wide-eyed, the clone stood up from the chair and tried to run, but not fast enough. Joshua pulled the trigger, and just like that, Joshua Ray Tucker shot his own father dead in his family home. Or had he? He wasn't sure of much anymore. The body heaped on the floor looked like his father, but that's exactly how they trick you. Joshua's heart was racing as he struggled to get a grasp on what was real and what was fantasy. Then the voices returned. Clean up and shut up, the wall said. So that's just what Joshua did. First, he picked his son up from school, relieved to find him safe and sound, but terrified of what that might mean. Then he dropped the kid off at his mother's house. He didn't want him to see what had happened. But what had exactly happened? Joshua's doubts returned as he scrubbed the blood from the floor, with the voices berating him all around. At times lucid, the reality of what he had done would seep through the cracks in his paranoid delusions for a few moments, all the while caught between a horrific reality and terrifying fantasy. He dumped the gun in a creek and heaved the body of his father into the front loader of a tractor. With the body safely stowed out of sight, a despondent Joshua weighed his options. The Aftermath 
By this point, the pressure on the past was unbearable. His own father was dead, either due to drug cartel, Illuminati body snatchers, or by his own hands. He couldn't be entirely sure. With nobody left to trust, he did the last thing he could think of trying. On the 31st of May, Joshua walked into the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Station in North Battlefield. In a hushed voice, he explained that he wanted to act as an informant. When officers took him back for questioning, he cried while explaining that he and his son desperately needed protection. Forces beyond their understanding were after them, and if the police would only watch the property, they'd see that he wasn't lying. He also requested blood tests and a CT scan, perhaps wondering if he himself was who he thought he was. So the Mounties went to the farm and ended up catching several of the alien shapeshifters in the act, who then took their monstrous final forms and gunned down the Mounties. And that was how we defeated the great Canadian body snatcher invasion of 2018, except except you'd have definitely heard of that or if you prefer the real but more depressing ending that's when the police called kim tucker in british columbia who told them that her husband wasn't answering her calls they then went to investigate the farm finding bloody clothes around the house and the body of gordon tucker wrapped in a garage floor mat at the back of the barn meanwhile joshua had been taken to battlefield mental health center for a psychological examination that he didn't pass yeah i know i've said this many many times but that should have happened about three pages ago four pages ago five pages ago god a crash landing in reality over the weeks which followed the police and crown prosecution service managed to put together a full picture of events they spoke to kim now a grieving widow who explained that joshua had always suffered from mental health issues since his teenage years his paranoia was only exacerbated by a methamphetamine habit in fact he had even been taken in by police on a mental health warrant earlier that year in a meeting with his court-appointed psychologist on the 7th of may joshua told him about the phantom voices in the attic it was just before then that he relapsed on his drug habits which it seems had a cascading effect for his mental health across the following weeks he also admitted to the psychologist his fears about retribution from his old gang acquaintances the makings of a perfect storm of paranoia which ended in a disaster fit for a greek tragedy now in the custody of the rcmp joshua would be faced with the grim prospect of returning to a reality in which he was guilty of murdering his own father he can't they're not going to make him guilty of that right he's clearly wasn't in his right mind he readily admitted all the details to the police when questioned continuing to drift in and out of lucidity in one of his more clear-headed moments he admitted i thought he was an imposter i fired at him and i hit him in the back once the police had separated fact from fiction and corroborated joshua's story with reports from his mother psychologist ex-partner and biological mother the authorities were faced with a difficult question if a guy genuinely believes his father is an evil shape-shifting kidnapper who's threatening his little boy how culpable is he for killing him i would say not very however he does need to go to a mental institution until he is uh until he is sane enough to be released the judgment Opinions were divided on the fate of the paranoid patricide now charged with second-degree murder and a breach of probation. On the one hand, he had a proven track record of mental illness which matched up with the symptoms on show in that tumultuous month. On the other hand, the prosecutors were able to display the lengths to which Joshua had gone to cover up the crime scene, suggesting a degree of rational comprehension. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> the, if you're like the voice has told me to do it, they could, you know, you could be taking rational actions, right? Even if... E e e because he's hiding a body snatcher's body ah this that's weak sure he made a mess of the cleanup by leaving body bloody clothes everywhere his underwear was still a blood stain when he went to the police station but loading a body into a tractor takes a fair bit of forethought and execution joshua maintains that he had heard voices instructing him to do so and wanted to protect his son from the shock of seeing a dead grandpa doppelganger or no doppelganger throughout the whole thing he pled not guilty after psychologist Dr. Mansfield Mailer examined Joshua at the forensic unit of Saskatchewan Hospital in July of 2018, he built a deeper profile of the delusions to present to the courts. The root of it all was the worries of retaliation from some shadowy criminal organization he believed was connected to his old drug contacts. Not a completely absurd idea. Well, it's interesting. I feel like that's the, the little seed that set him off, right? But as is often the case with this kind of thing when left unchecked, the fiction Joshua's troubled mind was building spiraled way out of control. By the time he shot his father, it encompassed all the bizarre elements we've already seen, like TV messages and government clones. The official diagnosis presented to the courts was schizophrenia spectrum disorder, but you probably guessed as much. Yeah, yeah, kind of about, you know, four or five pages ago. As <laughs> soon as there's like, there's listening devices, I'm like he's not well these proceedings continued for about two and a half years wow at the battlefield courthouse then in february of this year that's 2021 for people listening not right now joshua tucker was found not criminally responsible for the murder of his father judge g a meshishnik 
uh, returned the decision based on the opinions of the forensic psychiatrists and the Crown's admission. I am satisfied that the conditions that Joshua claims to have suffered from satisfy the legal test for disease of the mind. Post defense conduct of a person suffering from a disease of the mind may not be rational, nor is conduct after the incident conclusive evidence of whether a person had an operating mind capable of rational thought at the time of the incident. I'm glad that he's on the same page as me. In short, he was inhabiting a totally different reality at the time. The cleanup doesn't negate his delusions, and he should be dealt with as an extremely sick patient rather than a criminal. As a result, Joshua was returned to the mental ward at Saskatchewan Hospital to be held for an undetermined length of time. Repair costs for the ceiling plaster have presumably skyrocketed since his admission. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, Gallum, I don't think they let him have a gun. <laughs> or an axe. And that's just about as happy ending as we can hope from, for from such a sad story. By all accounts, Joshua and his adoptive father had a loving relationship throughout their 27 years together, but a spiral into paranoid delusions ultimately brought that to a horrific end. Ultimately, both men were victims of Joshua's undiagnosed struggle with schizophrenia. If you're wondering why I didn't just come out and tell you about his condition right away, I'm sorry, Callum. <laughs> From like the immediate beginning, I already began to guess. Well, let's find out the rationale anyway. But I mean, this is what this is what this show is about. I'm here on the journey with you, dear listener. Number one, nobody will publish my thriller novel, so I need an outlet. And number two, it's one thing to judge a person's person's delusions from afar, but another thing entirely to view them from the inside, to try and imagine what it's like for your world to be so utterly consumed by your fears that they supplant reality. Yeah, it's got to be absolutely terrifying. Anyone in that situation deserves our sympathy first and foremost. The human brain is a fragile, messy piece of meaty tech which can go haywire in a million different ways. Most of us have probably experienced this to some degree in our lives. Yeah, the brain is all sorts of weird. Like, you're like, hey, brain, why do you feel like that? What's wrong with you? Brain? Stop it. As always, empathy and understanding are key to getting back on track. Yeah, I feel, I, I, I mean, I don't think he's guilty in any way. I think he's just a very sick man who needs a lot of help. On a very, very related note, if any of Joshua's symptoms sound familiar to you from your own experience of that or anyone you know, best to get help as soon as possible. We'll leave a few resources linked below. Yes, this is a good thing to do. Um, I'll just actually read the link in case you're listening to this, but you can go to, um, oh gosh, how to say that, mhanational.org forward slash conditions forward slash schizophrenia. And I imagine that will have some uh, resources on the condition. So thank you, Callum, for doing that. As for Joshua Tucker, we wish him the best in his recovery. I can't imagine how tough it will be coming to terms with the events of that night. But here's hoping he can find some sort of resolution. Dismembered Appendices Mistaking your loved one for an imposter is known as Capgras syndrome. Yes, that's the syndrome I was thinking of. Thank you for reminding me. And it's actually quite common in the world of true crime. Consider the case of Blase Cott, a Kiwi who killed his wife in 2010, believing she was impo an imposter, or Jeremiah Wright from New Orleans, who in 2014 dismembered his disabled son, purportedly in the belief that he was dismantling a CPR dummy. That is terrifying. And on that terrifying note, this has been another episode of The Casual Criminalist. I do hope you... I don't know if I can ask whether you enjoyed it. This was really sad. Um, well, I hope you found it interesting at least. If you'd like to leave a review for this show and you're listening to it as a podcast, please do that, especially if you listen on Apple Podcasts. Those are super valuable. Spotify is the other big platform where everyone listens to this show, unless you're watching it on YouTube, of course. Uh, you can't leave reviews there, which is kind of disappointing. And if you're watching on YouTube, you know what to do. There's a like button, there's a subscribe button, there's a comment section. And thanks for watching. <laughs>